Hello, welcome back to my basement. I love movies. It's probably apparent by now, but I just wanted to let you know how much I love film. And one of my favorite things about film is how you get to experience other people's perspectives on the world and get to see other cultures and other lives portrayed through the medium of film. And the people that make this art, the people that make these films possible, are the filmmakers, the directors and writers and editors and producers behind the work. That's why I thought we would take a look at some of these filmmakers that make more personal projects, to see where they started from, and see how their experiences in the world of creating film and art in general affected what is shown on screen in their work. So, for our first entry in the series, I thought I would take a look at a modern-day indie filmmaker that I think is a little bit understated for just how much she's accomplished in her career. She's only made three features so far, but her place in the world of film and art in general cannot be understated. I'm of course talking about Miranda July. She's probably most well known for her 2005 film, Me and You and Everyone We Know. However, that's only one part of her long career that expands not just film, but also books, live performance pieces, sculptures, and much, 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 much more. The kid has no face. He's faceless. Raised in Berkeley, California, Miranda July always fostered a DIY aesthetic even during her early days as an artist. She continued to surround herself with DIY communities after dropping out of college and moving to Portland, Oregon. In particular, it was the Riot Girl scene that she participated in and was motivated by. The Riot Girl movement was a punk feminist subculture that gained popularity in the Pacific Northwest of America. This culture was heavily present in the local female-led punk music scene of Portland at the time. Miranda gravitated towards the female-led DIY ethos of this movement, becoming friends with many bands in the scene, and even founding her own short-lived band. Eventually, she decided to incorporate the Riot Girl ethic into the world of film. She did this in the hopes of inspiring young women to create movies and fostering a community of sorts with them. Of course, this was in the mid-1990s when the internet was in its infancy. It was a lot harder to get word about this project out then than it would be to now. Also, making a movie seemed like an impossible feat then. Now, everyone has a video camera in their pockets, but at the time, video equipment was still rather expensive and movie making was being gatekept by Hollywood elites. Despite these drawbacks, she began running the project, originally called Big Miss Moviola, in 1995. The way that this system works is that you would send a tape with your short film on it to Marina of July in Portland. She would then attach this film to a so-called chainmail tape that contained nine other short films from other like-minded women who were also directing films. She hoped this project would help foster a community with these young and upcoming female directors and help them be seen in a landscape that was so heavily dominated by men at the time. She spread the word about this project, touring with punk bands from the Riot Girl scene of Portland. And eventually, she would have her own dedicated live performances where she shared the word about the Big Miss Moviola tapes and showed some of the short films, as well as creating a film with the audience during these shows. As the years went on, the project got more and more successful, and eventually she had some interns helping her put together the tapes. The project was never huge, though, it was always a very underground thing, and it took a lot of time and resources on Miranda July's part without really generating any money or success for her in any way. Even still, the project still accomplished its goals, which were never to make money or get Miranda popular, it was to establish a community of young filmmakers. Which, it did. This project not only did this, but also forwarded Miranda July's career by inspiring her to make movies in the first place. Her first ever movie was released with the Big Miss Moviola videotapes. Miranda has said before in interviews that if it wasn't for Big Miss Moviola, she may not have gotten to making movies. These tapes allowed the idea of a movie to suddenly become more accessible for her and many other women. The name of Miranda July's first film was Atlanta, released in 1996. It appeared on the second ever Big Miss Moviola chainmail tape. The movie follows a young girl named Dawn, who is training to be an Olympic swimmer. It's pretty straightforward as a film, but it still deals with ideas of pressure and stress put on by a parental figure. The ideas of taking advantage of a child for your own personal fame is something that is ever more important to talk about in the digital age. 
this film still holds up and it's a great watch if you want to see where Miranda July started her career. Big Miss Moviola Project was a good starting point for Miranda, but wouldn't even come close to where she would end up. She ended up giving the project to the film department of Bard College in 2003. She would go on to create more short films, but also other art projects, like live performances. Her first live performance, Love Diamond, opened in 1998. This was a two-hour performance piece that Miranda herself described as a live movie. It combined pre-recorded footage with live performances from Miranda herself, who played multiple characters in the show. These themes primarily focused on the perceived cultural roles of women in society. This performance was a big step forward for Miranda July's career as it showed what she was truly capable of. This would be followed by another performance piece entitled The Swan Tool, a one-woman surrealist show focusing on themes of guilt and adult alienation. Several other short films would also be directed by July. One of these films, Nest of Tens, released in the year 2000, would be an important step in Miranda July's career as it was her first film that balanced several separate stories that all intertwined to create a bigger picture. While I don't think it was super successful in balancing all these stories, it is still an important film to mention. This is because she would later revisit the same story structure for her first ever feature, Me, You, and Everyone We Know. Each glow shall wake the skies, the stars shall bend their voices. You and Me and Everyone We Know had a very long production process. It was originally conceived by Miranda July in the early 2000s when she jotted the entire story down in a notebook after it suddenly popped in her head. She then went on to write a draft of the screenplay and submitted it to the Sundance Institute a total of three times before she was finally accepted in 2003. Later that same year, she started the Screenwriters Lab at Sundance where she workshopped her script, and the next year she did the Filmmakers Lab where she filmed early drafts of some scenes from the movie with a completely different cast than what appeared in the final film. These workshops helped the story of the film develop into what it eventually became, by allowing Mariah July to visualize what the film would eventually look like once it was put on a big screen. It also helped her to understand what to expect and prepare her for a real movie set. Some changes were made to the original screenplay like pulling back some of the more surreal and artsy elements and simplifying the romantic elements of the story. However, the heart and soul of the story was still maintained and the final cut of the movie that was released in the theaters touched on the same messages of childhood, romance, family, and humanhood itself that these early scenes did. Also, the elements that were omitted from the final cut of the film would later pop up again in her later works. Even though this first feature from Miranda July was a lot bigger of a production and less RC compared to her previous short films and performance pieces, it's clear that this film is a passion project for her. This film comes from July's own life and showcases many feelings and experiences that are integral not only to July herself, but to people in general. The structure of this movie being several separate short stories tied together through this weaving web of a story works in its favor. It's not like the movie's only touching on one singular experience or one singular idea or one singular concept that is relevant to people's everyday lives. It's touching on almost every concept that's relevant to people's everyday lives. It's a film about people's everyday lives. This allows the film to emotionally connect to almost anyone. It's one of the deepest and most introspective movies of our modern era, while not being too nihilistic or depressing. If anything, it's hopeful for the future. And that's why I think it connects with so many people. This is the culmination of everything Miranda July had worked up to uh, in her career so far. And yet, this wouldn't be near the end of her long, long career. After the release of Me and You and Everyone We Know in 2005, it was unknown where Miranda July's future would take her. In the meantime, she dipped her toes in many different art projects. In 2007, she created another performance piece called Things We Don't Understand and Are Definitely Not Going to Talk About, which is interesting for the fact that members of the audience played lead roles in the production as well as that this production, this show, would later go on to be the source material for one of Miranda July's later films. This performance was shown at many venues in the US. Also, around this time, she started writing short stories and a collection of some of these stories were published in 2007 under the title, No One Belongs Here More Than You. July began to mention around this time that she was working on a screenplay for a new film. This film would take a pretty long while to get released, 
after this announcement, not coming out until 2011. And this film was called The Future. This is the film that came out of the 2007 performance that we or talked about earlier. Miranda July said in interviews and documentaries that it was hard for her to write the script for this film, and that's kind of why it took so long, because the original show has so many abstract elements and themes that are only able to be shown in a live performance that wouldn't really work in a feature film, but despite this, she still did it. Uh, the film incorporates a lot of the original elements from the play. It does not sacrifice anything that the original performance had. It keeps a lot of the core concepts and values of the original show, like the talking cat, the time stopping, and the t-shirt dance. This film stars herself and Hamish Linklater in the lead roles of the film. The film focuses on themes of love, commitment, pain, guilt, and feeling like you're wasting your life. Brenna July said that she first conceived of this story after a breakup, and it shows because this film's a lot more nihilistic and depressing than her previous film, but it still has that hopeful edge and that whim that's a trademark of Miranda July's style. The movie also leans a lot more into this realism and artsiness than me and you and everyone we know, but that really only works in the film's favor. These abstract elements help to show how these characters are feeling in ways that could not be conveyed as naturally through conventional means. The film is able to show how it feels to be stuck in time, the feeling of your life slipping by, watching everyone around you live a fulfilling life while you're still trying to figure yours out. The characters in the movie try to make changes to move on with their lives, but they always end up in the same place. The film may not be as grand as me and you and everyone we know, but it still is incredibly profound if on a more personal level. It's a lot more closed off of a story compared to our first film, and may not convey as universal of an experience as that film, however, it still continues to touch on extremely human elements of connections with other people that are integral to all of Miranda July's work, even outside of her films. The film received a mixed reaction, uh, to say the least. I mean, this movie was not as accessible or as widely appealing to everyone as me and you and everyone we know. That film, although profound and complex, is still a quirky indie drama, kind of like a Wes Anderson movie or something. Something that anyone can get enjoyment out of and anyone will have a fun time with. This film, however, is a lot less accessible. I mean, the film contains a talking cat, for goodness sakes. And this cat isn't just a throwaway element either. It's the glue that holds the story together. It was a bit controversial for these weird abstract elements. Shortly after the film's release, she would release a non-fiction novel that kind of tied into the film in a way. The novel was called It Chooses You. And it was about her experience getting in contact, talking with and interviewing penny saver sellers in the Los Angeles area. One of these sellers, Joe, would impact her so much that she wrote a subplot about him into her film, The Future. And honestly, it works really well. It's really an element that feels necessary to the story and not something that's just tacked on. He would actually play himself in the movie and his house would play his own house in the film, as well as many of the stories that he told were real as a lot of his lines were improvised, even though it doesn't really come across that way in the film because the film does feel very tight-knit and put together and not super loose. Joe also voiced the talking moon in the film. After the release of her film, Miranda July would again turn back to other forms of art projects, including a subscription email art project called We Think Alone, an unconventional messaging app called Somebody, and another performance piece called New Society, where members of the audience would literally help create a new society. In 2015, July would release her first ever full-length fiction novel titled The First Bad Man. It received mainly positive reviews upon its release. In 2018, it was announced Miranda would return back to the world of film with a new feature film, this time a heist movie that was going to be produced by Brad Pitt's company, Plan B. The film will get its world premiere at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival in January of 2020, and it was released under the name Kajillionaire. You want to take me out to dinner? It's for my 18th birthday. Is it your birthday? No. 
I'm 26. Kajillionaire was Marina July's first feature to not star herself in any major way. Instead, it stars Evan Rachel Wood and Gina Rodriguez as the main characters. It also deals with themes of love, as Marina July's films often do, but not only in the way you'd expect. Yes, there is a romantic relationship that blossoms throughout the film, and while that's still a focal point of the story, the movie still touches on themes of familial love and relationships with parental figures. Old Dolio, the main character of the film, was born into a family of thieves and con artists, and was never treated as a child, but was rather treated as an accomplice and business partner to the group. When her family meets Melanie, they begin to craft a manufactured relationship with her in order to get close to her and eventually rob her. But as the film goes on, Old Dolio begins to form a relationship with Melanie. Even though the movie's technically a heist movie, it's not really a heist movie. It just uses the idea of a heist, the idea of a con artist family, as the backdrop for another quirky indie romantic drama. Like her first film. The film has all the heart of her first two outings and also touches on a lot of very human ideas and themes. It's a very beautiful film that returns back to the more hopeful whimsy of Miranda July's first film. It also finally incorporates a lesbian relationship into the story, which is something that Miranda July has been trying to add to her films since her first feature, Me and You Never When We Know. But it was removed from the script when they simplified the romantic elements of the film like I talked about earlier. All in all, this is a very wonderful movie. Since the release of her last film, Ren and July continued to work on art projects, the most recent project being a purchasable art book slash sculpture called Services. The run on this piece was very limited, with only 25 copies being available as it was manufactured entirely by hand. This book was released earlier this year. Miranda July's career is so large and vast that it's almost impossible to cover all of it in one video, despite her only releasing three films. But this video is never meant to be in a retrospective on her entire career. It was never meant to encapsulate everything she's ever done in her whole life. All I was trying to accomplish with this video is exposure to the works of this wonderful filmmaker and help you understand and have a conversation about many of the themes and ideas present in her I hope that conversation can continue in the comments. If you'd like to learn more about the career of this very accomplished filmmaker, I'd recommend checking out her website where she has all the projects she's ever created listed and archived to some extent. Also, there's a complete biography of her works available for purchase, which contains retrospectives of all these works from her and other collaborators that she's worked with in the past. And finally, please let me know what other filmmakers you'd like me to talk about in the comments. Again, I want this to be a series of sorts, so if you have anyone in mind that you think would be a good fit for this series, please let me know. And with that, I leave you. Goodbye.